Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our third lecture of Environmental Conscious Petroleum Engineering and a Roadmap for Sustainable Well Construction and Zero Emission Cars at Pio Petro. I hope all of you are doing well. My name is Rahima Babayeva, and I'm a graduate uh, from the University of Aberdeen. I have finished my Master of Science in Petroleum Engineering, and I am going to be your moderator for today's session on behalf of Arab Oil and Gas Academy. Today's webinar is going to be about fracking and acidizing. Can we innovate something better? Microsecond shockwave pulse, a surgical precision approach to well stimulation by Professor Rafi Gulawal. Professor Rafi Gulawal is the author of the leading chapter titled Environmental Conscious Petroleum Engineering in the book Environmental Conscious Fossil Fuel Production, John Wiley, 2010. He is currently located in Lubbock, West Texas, and served as a professor at, of petroleum engineering at the American University of Ras Al Kalma in the United Arab Emirates. Now, before starting today's session, I would like to mention that you can ask your question from question and answers part, and three to five questions will be answered by Professor Rafi Gulawal. Let's welcome Professor Rafi Gulawal. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Rafi Gul, we are delighted to be here today. Thank you very much, uh, Rahima, uh, for introducing me again. It is a great pleasure. And uh, good morning from Texas to all uh, attendees from across the world, and especially, I think, from the Middle East, Ramadan Mubarak also, as we go towards the finishing line. So let me be, uh, begin here uh, to this topic. As the topic is at the bottom uh, on the yellow background, uh, environmentally disturbing whale stimulation. What was announced so far, I have slightly modified, you know, but the subtitle is same, can't we develop a clean technology? So the environmental disturbing uh, well stimulation, which means acidizing, and of course, the much talked about and much popular in the oil and gas industry, especially in America, the hydraulic fracturing, the formal terminology, but the common term for that is fracking, created by the people outside the oil and gas industry. So uh, uh, it has some connotations, but we accept it. What people say about this phenomenon of hydraulic fracturing, for the sake of brevity and a shortcut, fracking is fine with me, and I would continue with that word fracking. And it is disturbing because people have been disturbed uh, uh, for good uh, or, or for worse, for whatever reasons. But as petroleum engineers in the industry, in the academia, and also those who are semi-retired like me or retired, we always focus on the objective side, that this is a technology and we learn about it as a student and we keep learning uh, when we go into the industry or the academia to teach or do further research. And we keep on improving that. Hydraulic fracturing, acidizing. In terms of the benefits to the main stakeholder, which is the oil and gas operating company, it has improved in, in science term, in engineering term, in technology terms, no doubt. But uh, also the environmentally uh, sensitive aspects, which has been classically addressed in the industry itself, including the societies like Society of Petroleum Engineers, as HSE, Health, Safety and Environment. Well, we understand that. So now we need to put more attention as petroleum engineers in the industry and R&D institutions, and of course, the academia. We need to go beyond that, and uh, whatever we have achieved in terms of its techno-economic aspect, uh, and the HSE aspect, we should not congratulate ourselves that the maximum has been done. No, we can do much more. So with that thing in mind, I want to open this question. can we develop? a clean technology. Of course we can, but how? So before I proceed further, I want to again put this disclaimer 
uh, like uh, the past two days. And now here is time to go for a quick recap of what we presented or what we or I discussed on yesterday on the topic, which was sustained casing pressure, SCP. Means there is continuous you know, migration of gas from the oil or gas reservoir behind the casing. Uh, although the cement sheet, which we place uh, as a seal, uh, is supposed to stop migration of any fluid, gas and liquid, but we have found that it doesn't happen. And there is lots of report from the US uh, go federal government agency about US and what is happening in America with the best technology, best practices and intentions. It is same thing is happening all over the world, more or less. So we address the question, how we can find a better replacement or something better than the conventional API class cement. We found that there is something called geopolymer. Geopolymer is a better alternative to age old API class Portland cement formulations. And then we were excited, especially <laughs> me, that in the, for the last couple of years, uh, some uh, companies, technology companies uh, through their through their research and development, they have come up uh, with the metal to metal seal technology, which is really good news. It can go for the traditional plug and abandonment to put a plug at different locations inside the tubing or the casing, production casing. And of course, uh, they also suggest that at the time of constructing a new well, which is we call well construction uh, with well completion, we can place a nuller seal also. And we found that there is something called a bismuth seal, which is good up to a depth of around, you know, uh, corresponding to temperature of 300 degree Fahrenheit, because uh, to be safe, bismuth is a metal, heavy metal, uh, not heavy in the sense we come across in literature, but heavy in terms of, you know, with respect to iron. It, is, uh, it has a specific gravity of around 10 or 11 compared to iron or steel, which is 7.8 or something like that. Uh, so it is 300 degree Fahrenheit. So, and we are good, I believe, for 99% of the wells that we have encountered so far across the world. And then comes thermite iron seal. And of course, it is uh, the reaction produces over here. This the reaction is shown over here. We have seen and the iron is produced, hot molten iron, and it is diverted to wherever we want to place the seal, an annular or the plug. And uh, iron has a very high melting point, so it can go to any depth. So then we said, well, this is a too early uh, to say whether it will be really uh, you know, better performing over a long time. This time is most important. What a, a technology uh, like this may be very nice, you know, for a couple of days, but we have to see the effect of time, especially when the seals are placed in a harsh environment. And uh, I think the work environment <laughs> uh, for anything, even for a metal, you know, is uh, the borehole, deep boreholes. We have all kinds of things, hydrogen sulfide, CO2 and whatnot, and also high temperature to make uh, those uh, reactions, you know, uh, oxidizing reactions even faster. So, so I kept that uh, scientific uh, alert uh, or uh, point in my mind, and I presented that uh, uh, a comment about all three of them, geopolymer, uh, it is well, uh, just a couple of wells uh, demonstration is not enough. It deserves or it needs more field trials. And the metal to metal seal, of course, only a couple of two years. And But before we go for field trials, we should address this fundamental science questions that bismuth and thermite, which is, gives iron seal, may deteriorate, uh, de 
deteriorate fast by oxidation because uh, this picture shows over here. Uh, uh, so uh, let me go back. Okay, over here, this is uh, the oxide of iron, which is rust. So even steel pipe, uh, which we use, they get rusted in the well bore. So we have a cathodic protection system, uh, you know, to keep it uh, to decrease the rate of uh, that uh, rusting process and keep it in good condition. And we can imagine uh, about uh, the uh, bare iron, which is not even steel, you know. And so this is a point uh, uh, of suspicion. So we should be careful, but not avoid. What we can do, and what I suggest to myself, that when we go for the thermite reaction, we should put among the materials some ingredients, like a little bit of carbon, some amount of chromium, so that the end point is not molten iron, but molten iron with all those things that make it a steel, or even stainless steel. But there is a room for tremendous R&D, which is good for me, good for you, good for young engineers to develop it further, make patent, start up uh, and be, uh, begin business uh, as is well, and, uh, and keep on going. So that's one thing. And also the bismuth, the bismuth also comes in mixture from uh, bismite, which is bismuth, uh, just like iron oxide, bismuth oxide. So it is also susceptible to be, you know, destroyed, you know, this, uh, the effect of the elements means this harsh environment, uh, H2S and uh, oxygen and high temperature. So there's plenty of room for improvement. And that's a good thing. So again, I have to say that our job as engineers and scientists is to Take the best options available, look at its, you know, at the weaknesses and try to remove those weaknesses and make it better overall than what we have now. For example, Portland cement, you know. So uh, that uh, we have, uh, uh, so I have to show what I said, I showed over here that uh, these things will, uh, the bismuth will be, the, this is the bismite. So it's a nice bismuth metal, but in the presence of oxygen and temperature, it will go back to its native form. This is bismite. Same thing with the uh, iron. It can become rust, just like this. And this is hematite. And we know hematite is the mineral that we mine as the source of iron. And then we smelt it and the rest is, of course, we know. Similarly, there is a, a heavier mineral called magnetite. From this magnetite, we produce again iron and make steel out of it. So this story uh, goes on. So now let us come to, to this topic. And uh, I want to say that uh, this question of fracking and acidizing can't use if, as I said, fracking is the community of petroleum engineers, they don't like the award because uh, uh, they have been blown, we have been blamed for hydraulic fracturing and they say, oh, those fracking guys. But uh, I don't mind because we serve the people, we serve the society. So when they say fracking, okay, okay, we understand it's just fracking and it's just negative things and we'll, and we'll remove all the negative things, you know? Just like a doctor gives a medication for treatment, but the medication has side effects. So doctor also gives vitamin and some other things to take care of the side effects. Of course, here we are talking about, you know, not giving something additional, uh, uh, maybe if possible, but uh, we are looking for even outside the box. That's how geopolymer came in and the two metal seal concept, which we say M to M, metal to metal seals. And now today is uh, uh, fracking and acidizing. I can to innovate something better. And before answering that question, I have to take a sub question. And this actually came from one of my connections on LinkedIn a couple of days ago. 
and I thought about it. I answered it the best of my subject matter expertise in rock mechanics and geomechanics and uh, well completion engineer, well completion engineering, uh, those are hardwares, everything. And the question was why unconventional fracking are more harmful in causing methane leakage from wells. So this fracking is coming into the picture. You know? So it makes very sense. So it is a con continuous discussion. The first keep in mind that, that this fracking goes mainly, it began in Barnett uh, gas field, uh, uh, shell gas in Dallas area, huge area. So this uh, massive hydraulic fracturing started uh, there to extract natural gas from uh, this, uh, what we thought for 110 years is impossible task to produce oil and gas from shell, but it has happened now because of massive fracturing, okay? But uh, initially we produced natural gas, but as we expanded this technology, horizontal well and hydraulic fracturing into other shale resources, you know, for example, in Eagle Ford, in Texas, South Texas, where I'm living, and then Delaware Basin, uh, where I am from that area in Lubbock. Then on the Northern side, we have Marcellus. Uh, and of course, China is the king. China has the largest, you know, shale gas uh, reservoirs. So we should keep in mind that natural gas is the, is the least harmful of all the fossil energy sources, which is coal and then comes oil and gas. But, uh, and under uh, this uh, 2016 uh, Paris Agreement, methane or natural gas is accepted as the best uh, transition period uh, energy resource toward clean energy. It's carbon free energy. For example, hydrogen or electricity from different sources. So uh, we, we have to keep that in mind. And, uh, and, and without that, we cannot jump onto the new ship, which is called clean energy, you know? We have to jump from another ship, the best possible ship, HHIP ship, which is natural gas, because we need so much of energy all over the world. So from where this energy will come? From sun, it's very limited, you know? Like in 1840s, the lamp oil, the best quality was uh, well oil. It was very limited, not for the ordinary people, not for the middle class, only for the rich elite could afford it because of lack of supply. So within that framework, we have to continue evolving. And here is, I have put a bottom headline, cement sheet. Debonding is related to shale fracking. So shale fracking, and uh, this is, means extra amount of shimed seed debonding is happening because of extra pressure that we apply. I put this discussion yesterday, and uh, and I would summarize that here again that how it happens, why shale fracking? Because shale fracking. Our uh, fracturing, it needs tremendously high pressure, like 20,000, even more PSI. In conventional, we don't need that much. And uh, we don't go for massive hydraulic fracturing. But shale, we need massive hydraulic fracturing. Massive means not only massive supply of fracking water and the propane, but also tremendously high pressure. And this is we compared with the you know, strength of the rock and the cement. And shale and cement, they are in the same group in terms of tensile strength and compressive strength. And the fractures happen by uh, tensile strength because, uh, and which is very low, 500 to 1000 PSI. So if you just put these two numbers side by side, 20,000 pressure applied on the very weak guys, it is like Mike Tyson punching you and me. We will not uh, be knocked out, we will be knocked out from the earth. 
you know, the here, no doctor can save us if Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali comes and punches us. <laughs> so it's just like that. So I'll not uh, spend much more time. This is enough. Those who are interested can uh, dig further, of course. And I also put one more thing over here that this uh, fracturing over here, you know, over long horizontal wells uh, or in conventional and stone or carbonate reservoirs where we have oil or gas, not shale, and we have horizontal wells and maybe multi stress fracturing. So it is a common thing that, and I'm very surprised that we can never think of directional fractures. You know, for example, here we have see the shale over here from uh, this point in the mouse to over here as you go, and those bright spots are where you have put uh, those, uh, for example, perfor uh, the perforation shape just perforators to be the empty holes for the frac fluid to enter and get fractures. And it goes on and on over long 10,000 feet, for example. And uh, the fractures will open upward and downward. And they are at least 100 feet long. So or it may be 500. You don't control uh, precisely. You design your pumping to reach 150, but it may go because of the inhomogeneity. You don't have information about the different you know, heterogeneity over here. So it may go 500 feet over here. So it may go this rock shale for the millions of years. It was there as a seal, capro. Seal means preventing flow of fluid from further below. So now in our business to uh, produce this oil and gas, which is not in a huge amount from, uh, uh, it is maybe huge amount, but without any connectivity from one point to another, we call it permeability, and we are creating massive fractures. So we are forgetting that we are opening uh, or we're throwing the gate to the barbarians. The barbarians are over here, toxic fluid or different kind, heavy metals, everything. So if this flows from here, it can you know, travel behind the casing because of uh, the debonding uh, caused by high hydraulic pressure during fracturing. And of course, same thing happens, it goes. So this is very important. Uh, uh, why? Because uh, first point is, even I believe within this conventional practice of high pressure fracking, it is possible to avoid this fracturing in the downward directions. For example, when we make perforations here and here, we should perforate only in the upward direction, okay? So they will say, okay, Professor Awal, how about the oil from the downward directions? I will say, why don't you take this horizontal well a little bit below? So keep some safe distance, let's say 100 feet, and put your horizontal well, and at the first stage and the initial uh, task, make this perforation only upward. And then you start a fracking operation. So fracture will open mainly in the upward directions. But this is easy to see. I mean, the thing uh, it, because this diagram is two dimensional, in three dimensional, even that will ultimately come downward. So uh, we can make slight improvement, but not much. So and I, what I, uh, I want to say that even with this new idea about directional keeping the fractures only in the upward direction in this case, uh, we still run the risk of you know, uh, inviting the fluids from below the cap rock. So let's go further. And this is uh, the last point uh, that uh, we have come to know how much uh, those uh, uh, gas migration happens uh, from failure of casing after some time because of corrosion and of course the broken seal, cement sheet. Uh, so, and uh, that uh, gives, uh, releases methane uh, uh, to the atmosphere. It's very harmful, 40 to 70 times 
you know, it has more warming effect than carbon dioxide. So this is very important to keep in mind. CO2 and CH4. CH4 is our creation, mainly anthropogenic, man-made, okay? And we need to control that. And that brings us on the table, massive hydraulic fracturing. So hydraulic fracturing, we have to now see what we can do. We call it st reservoir stimulations. We have to think about some methods, you know, away from hydraulic, uh, hydraulic fracturing or fracking. The other thing is, uh, which is used to clean the uh, wellbore region two to three feet around the well in touch with the reservoir containing oil or gas because of drilling time or production related formation damage. So the conventional method is, you know, for uh, carbonate rocks, carbonate uh, uh, to use hydrochloric acid, dilute hydrochloric acid, and some formulations uh, uh, to make it uh, better and safer. But then an acid is an acid, is an acid. And, and, and some smart people say go for acid fracking. That will, uh, from uh, whatever we have discussed so far, that will make even only worse. So we have to take both these candidates, so we, or the soldiers, or whatever you call it, acidizing, matrix acidizing, soaking the rock with a hydrochloric acid, and uh, then acid fracking, and then we have uh, this uh, hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Uh, all we have to now we have to search for new candidates. I'm sorry to say that uh, uh, with due respect to the popular opinion concept, uh, uh, we have to say, you know, from our side also, yes, this hydraulic fracturing, as is, it is practiced nowadays, actually they are making from bad to worse. Before they used to do it on maybe 3,000 feet long horizontal well, let's say 20 stages. Now to get more oil, they drill longer horizontal well and more stages of fractures, 250 or 200. It is quite a demanding effect, okay? So we have to stop and think and let us go ahead. So the question that we started with is that why don't we create environmentally benign well stimulation technology? Of course, everybody wants it for the oil companies, well, somebody has to make, do it for them. They'll not do it for themselves, as I told yesterday. They make so much money with this, you know. Let's say there is no Paris Convention. Oh my God, maybe after two years, they will drill 20,000 feet long horizontal well and 500 stages. But because of Paris Convention, uh, you know, now uh, we have to uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, wisely. And uh, so this question makes now better sense. But again, I believe the oil companies will not come forward. That, oh, world of scientists, engineers, can you give us something environmentally benign, well stimulus technology? I have been trying for the last 10 years. With what? With this. That actually I did. In 2010, the same year I wrote uh, this invited book chapter uh, we are talking about in the last two days. And uh, I did uh, at Texas Tech University. And here is the news. That news of my invention disclosure, we call it in the university, is still there at the website, Texas Tech University. And if you, uh, and that I call uh, the environmentally benign well stimulation technology. It is here since 2010, and here is the news. This is the Texas Tech website. I clicked yesterday, it is there, so I thought, and it was released on February 2010, just 12 February, and, and here you see yours truly smiling here because of the success of the new concept. It took me two years of 
uh, you know, developing the hardware with the help of Professor Dr. Magnet Christiansen. He was a professor of electrical and computer engineering. And Paul with, uh, Whitefield Horn Professor. This is the highest level of distinguished professorship. He was one of them. And he was the founding director of the Center for Pulse Power and Power Electronics to create the device. Device specification was mine, how much power it has to generate, that's all. But how to use that power, that is completely my IP invention. And I had I, uh, a graduate student, Shruta uh, from School of Indian School of Mines. He was a mechanical engineer and he came to uh, Texas Tech for his master's. And I found him very bright, intelligent, hardworking. So I needed, so I hired him as a research assistant from my grant, uh, initial startup research grant that I received from Texas Tech. Uh, so he received his uh, half, we call it half uh, incentive, you know, for 20 hours, which is more than enough for a family of two. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, so he was helping me in running the experiments. So I designed the experiments and he was my assistant, making samples of concrete and then blasting, not blasting, making clinical precision fractures. Well, it didn't happen from day one. We spent a couple of two months in a very scientific and engineering manner to develop that particular electrode, which will convert that electrical power, you know, we used uh, uh, 20,000 volt uh, storage energy storage capacitor. And that was, of course, from the for military purpose, and it was uh, courtesy of Professor Magda Christiansen, and around that huge gigantic energy storage capacitor cap, you know, uh, charged to a voltage of twenty thousand volt, and to store two kilojoule, two kilojoule of energy, and then the circuit was designed to release that in a few microseconds. So when the energy is released, released through my device, okay, to generate shockwave, light and shockwave. I'll show you the initial shots. Uh, it is very interesting. And uh, uh, our engineered uh, methodology of developing uh, uh, that tool to maximize the delivery of that electrical stored energy to make an energy, you know, by what is called impedance matching, and that we received. It's a very complex circuitry, but I, I, I was so enthusiastic to do the best, and uh, I did all the research one needed single-handed. It was IP, and I was successful to develop that delivery system, uh, which will convert. You know, I call it electrode, okay? And that pulse power released from uh, that uh, energy storage capacitor over a few microseconds, 10 to 50 microseconds that I could control also. It was needed. And here comes uh, the results after a few slides. I'll show the results after a few slides. I need to show also you what was existing in the world at the time. This is the thing that at the time was existing from Russia, 2001, by a startup company in Moscow called Novas Energy. Actually, I didn't know about that. When I did, <coughs> all this information was not there because Russia just came out from the Soviet era iron dome or whatever, iron uh, screen or iron wall, I think the, the, the word. But Professor Magnus Christiansen, he happened to attend in 1994 or 1995 a Pulse Power conference in Moscow. And he chatted with some Soviet era Pulse Power scientists and engineers. And they told him that they are trying to discharge that Pulse Power high voltage, high current 
in some water wells. And so I got interested and I, I started digging the literature and this came out over here. So it was just that this serves as a spark. So when electricity, high voltage and high current, how much a current? Maybe 50,000 amperes. And 50,000 ampere, you know, we ordinary people and scientists have no idea what it means. So put it in proper perspective. I tell you all this, uh, you know, uh, home electrical circuitry for lighting, for fan, uh, carry generally five uh, amperes, you know. If it is a microwave, they have to increase the transformer to high voltage, but the supply lines are carry in a, at home carry uh, generally inside indoor five amperes. For washing machine or electrical stove, maybe uh, higher, uh, maybe 15 or 20 ampere. So you can imagine. Uh, so the system they used to, uh, over here in the Soviet era to uh, remove the scales, carbonate and barium sulfur, uh, sulfate scales, uh, which are uh, uh, formed in the aquifer you know, section down below where they deal the water wells and their hard scales. So they block the flow of water from uh, the porous media to the well. So a few blasts, those uh, scales of uh, you know, calcite and the barium sulfate, etc., calcium carbonate, uh, they drop off and water flows better. It is just like we call it uh, stimulation, water well stimulation, okay? So that was it, but it was the first generation. Uh, what I mean by first generation here means the technology of converting electrical uh, energy into mechanical energy, okay? Uh, through the device called the spark, you know, a gap, a spark gap. That's a very primitive, you know, uh, the, uh, you can create that by accident. Uh, so that's the, the, that is the first generation. And, uh, and why is it important? Because most of the electrical energy that comes from the circuit are not converted. So the conversion efficiency is very low, very poor. So that's why you have to have gigantic huge circuit, you know, capacitor banks and everything becomes huge. So, if we want to put uh, in the deep uh, oil or gas wells, you know, for that purpose, uh, it will be impossible. You just can't do it because this is water wells are shallow, maybe 200 feet. You can supply that high voltage, high current through the cable, you know. But if this cable is 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet, you know, and it's thick enough, most of the energy will be spent as a heat. So we have to, so our research focus was to develop uh, better than the first generation, you know, the electrical to mechanical or shock wave conversion energy. So these people uh, after, you know, some time, uh, they gave the license to a startup company in Canada in 2011 with that first generation technology you know, they now, by the time the capacitors became, you know, technology was advanced, so they could create a smaller size capacitors uh, and pack it with lots of uh, stored electrical energy. Not very high, but quite enough to put it through the well bore. It goes, everything. This first part is, which contains the electrical uh, capacitor banks uh, and they're charged from surface by ordinary, you know, let's say a current supplier and it charges and they discharge it. So when they discharge it, it creates some truck wave, it knocks up just like a little extended version of the water well stimulation. So no question of fracking here, okay? They call it another. So now uh, the demand uh, in terms of stimulation in oil and gas is uh, uh, much higher, you know, to say, well, if I don't get a significant amount 
of an you know, increase in productivity of oil, then why should I use this technology? So what <laughs> this company, uh, Blue Spark, they got the license from Novas, you know, in Moscow. They did. They said, okay, we all, after a few shots of electric sparks, okay, uh, the pump acid. <laughs> Uh, and of course, as we know, man, I, I'm laughing because what is the uh, benefit of uh, bringing something better than this disturbing acid and whatever? So that's why I'm laughing. I hope you get it. Now, I'm talking about second generation. This is 1976. This is a piece of information you will never get. I can get you because this is only in one place in a local conference we have every year at Texas Tech University for the last, I think, since 1960, you know, these small, small oil producers, oil producers, they have a carnival sort of thing. They call it short codes. That's like we have the short codes. And those thousands of people who have, someone has two wells, someone has 10 wells, someone has 50 wells, and uh, they all come. They are the people who cut the corners. So they improvise many things to get a few extra barrels of oil up. And they join heads and extend their ideas and go back with some smart idea. It always helps. So that has been continuing for, since 1960. And the host is the and Hart uh, Department of Petroleum Engineering uh, of Texas Tech, where I was a professor in 2007 to 2013, then I resigned uh, because I was uh, called in over telephone by Conor Phillips R&D to join and uh, uh, set up a new uh, fracture conductivity lab, which I did, and I did more than that, but that is not the subject of discussion here. So, and the person who is behind this in terms of its management is Professor uh, Lloyd Hanji. He's still there. He's the senior most professor here at Texas Tech, Department of Bob L. Bob L. Hart, Bob L. Hart uh, Department of Petroleum Engineering. So in around 2013, just before I was leaving Texas Tech, one uh, PhD student uh, who was working with another professor, very senior, and very renowned in the industry. He has died a couple of years ago. His, his name is uh, Professor Harold Winkler. He has phenomenal contribution in artificial lift methods, especially the pumps, you know, the beam pumps or saccharide pumps. He is, you know, one of the top persons expected, uh, and he is to contribute to the oil and gas journal every year about the updates. So this student uh, was very bright. Now he's a very senior guy in Halliburton, I guess. His name is Mehdi. And he came, Professor Awal, I was going, I'm designing a new uh, valve for the gas lift valve. Uh, I'm sorry, I said Sakharov pump. Sakharov pump is maybe his second, but the first and foremost, he is the champion, was the champion pioneer of gas lift and pumping. All those in the ancient times, you know, in the 20s, 30s, uh, those uh, uh, high producing oil wells in Iran, you know, and Middle East, he used to put those gas lift system they had designed, you know. So anyway, so the, uh, his student was trying to do something better, which is uh, what we do. And he came across this particular presentation made by one small company, which is called Sonic International. It deserves attention and mention also, because a patent, he patented his method in 1982 in the United States of America, USPTO. And this original paper is available only at this Texas Tech University, Petroleum Engineering Department. And I can bet you only two persons uh, know about it. One is uh, Mehdi, now Dr. Mehdi, and the other person is me. I said, thank you, Mehdi. This is wonderful. 
And I took it, I photocopied it, and I then, of course, converted to PDF. It is with me. And he ran this business from 1976 through 1982, 84, when he died. And I think uh, he didn't uh, pass it to anybody or whatever happened. But it was very interesting because he used not a spa, spark gap. He put electrical wire here, very thin one. And that's called the exploding wire uh, to create. So it, cre it, it converts that electrical energy into a higher percentage of mechanical shockwaves. So it knocks off, you know, this is the cross section uh, cutaway, you know, uh, longitudinal view. This is the cement, this is the casing, and this is the, these are the scales, you know, barium sulfate, which you cannot dissolve with acid, you know. And uh, uh, this is the formation, of course. This is the perforation over here, you can see, but the perforations, you know, uh, the end part where the oil, uh, the, this is the borehole, you know, over here, is blocked with this, uh, you know, uh, uh, insoluble, these deposits of salts, barium salt, like that. So, he used to knock them off by this shockwave. And so this is in terms of energy conversion efficiency from electrical, mechanical shockwave is much, much more. And that's why I call it second generation. First generation, second generation. Now, by the time that was in 2013, and I proved the concept of uh, plasma shockwave fracturing in 2010, and mine is, third generation. <clears throat> so this is the third generation one. Uh, sorry about this. <clears throat> from lab. So it's a lab prototype. And so my purpose was that before we try something in the field, we have to take an engineered methodology approach that proved the concept in the lab, then study thoroughly, you know, in a systematic manner, how we can scale it up in terms of energy, in terms of size of the tool, you know, electrical tool that will go and mechanical tool. So all those things will happen if we can develop the fundamental secrets in the lab itself. We call it proof of concept. So it's a long procedure, but we did uh, the first part, which is the proof of concept or lab prototype in only in one year. And uh, so, I developed and I gave a name to it. Uh, at the time, I used to call it plasma stimulation and fracturing. So it creates fractures, but why I call it stimulation? It's because it also knocks off those uh, scales which uh, the Sonic International did in a much better way because in third generation, I use not a wire, not even a system of wires. I could. Use. I use a system of wires, not one wire, five in, in different assembly. I can call it uh, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.5, whatever. But I jumped that barrier before I came to know about that uh, to the third generation. Of course, uh, by using a foil, aluminum foil, very thin one, household aluminum foil. So a foil is a cluster of a huge number of wires. So you can see that there's no need to put 20 wires or 30 wires. Put, if you put uh, thousands of them, it will make a shit. So I went to that, okay? But that idea, I didn't have to think about it. The reason I want to say that the huge amount of review of literature, I was digging literature. I knew the best, this is a, uh, you know, uh, this hardware was built by this uh, center for pulse power and power electronics, uh, in whose uh, Professor Magnet Christensen was the director. Uh, for the past 80 years, they have been doing research only for US military. So this kind of technology is only with the military is purpose and those their contractors. Uh, one of the largest contractor was Texas Tech Universities, and uh, the Center for Pulse Power and uh, Power Electronics. So, uh, what happened? Uh, this uh, 
Uh, I, of course, <laughs> uh, Professor Magnetic Shenson did not know that I, I wanted to use uh, this aluminum sheet instead of a cluster of wires. Okay, so I found some declassified reports from U.S. United States Naval Surface Warfare R&D labs. They had some projects in the 80s and 90s, and uh, by 2008, those were declassified, means made uh, available to public. Not that they will come to the market and say, hey, these are our research reports, come on, take it. No, no. They, you have to dig for it, and it will not be blocked. So it's not hacking, but it is close to that. Go and find, and they, they have only limited publications distributed to some different military research centers or schools or wherever it is. So those are now on the internet, and uh, I could get it uh, legally from them. So I learned that uh, they have developed the uh, aluminum foil, okay? And that uh, was my starting point. Otherwise, it will take me years. And of course, uh, uh, you say that I'm lucky. Yes, I'm lucky. But it was my hard labor that took me to that point to find it. And let me go forward. Uh, this is the machine. I'll not describe it any fully. So this is the starting point where we have the, the charging target, high voltage, uh, to, uh, and the capacitor is... The, is the one over uh, here. this box over here you, you can see that is that energy storage capacitor one single this this is used for military purpose like in the tank or in the uh, fighter bombers like that or ships so that is the one and that has to be charged uh, to 20,000 volt and how long so that the electrical charge deposits uh, deposited there it stores a power of two kilojoule, 2,000 joule, okay? And this is the charging circuit, very sophisticated circuit. And this is the, your oscilloscope over here. So it is charged. Once it is charged, then at my command, I should be able to discharge it to some locations. And this is the cable, coaxial cable, which is rated for 20 kilovolt. And at the end, I'm not trying here, I put that device, which I created. Uh, it took me around six months and lots of trial and error, but in a systematic scientific methodology. And uh, so this is the finished product. Two, three months, different things happened. Uh, I had to start with smaller sizes, you know, four inch size diameter. In this one, this is the final, I was successful. Uh, this is uh, 11 and a half inch diameter. As you can see, this is white cement. We have the gray cement, Portland cement. This is a white cement. White cement has strong, it is stronger. This uh, conventional uh, Portland cement that we use for house or highways and uh, buildings, uh, the gray color that is around 3000 to 3500 PSI composite strength. But this is around 5000 to 6000. Okay, uh, why? Because the gray one we used before, they'll become shattered. So that means we have to put less power. But we could not put less power. Why? Because this machine that we had uh, received you know, from Pulse Power Center, it is built for my specifications and with the money funds from my startup research fund. Okay, so it is my machine as a professor. And at my disposal completely, nobody comes from nobody, uh, from no department, it's completely under lock and key with me and my student, of course. So we had no way of control. It is a basic bare bone circuit. We control, we, we, we don't have a regulator to charge more or less. There was a provision, but we have to open this whole box over here and then change it. We said, no, we are not expert in that, will get shocked at <laughs> whatever it is. Let us do something you know, without controlling. So we will progressively go from a small to medium to large enough size of blocks so that 
that block will not become into pieces as broken as if by an uh, explosion. We, we tried with four inch diameter and four inch uh, length, uh, eight inch length sample, it became pieces. Then we tried eight inch by eight inch, it became pieces. And then we tried with this uh, 11.5 inch diameter concrete block, you know, uh, which is height of around 18 inches. So it is, its weight is around 50 kilograms, okay? And at the center, we put this PVC pipe. Uh, while setting it, because this was initially a cement slurry, we had a equipment to make sure that we can make the same quality of cement blocks every time. We call it controlled samples, you know, those of you who know. And uh, while putting the slurry, we, before that, we put this pipe with the bottom end closed so that uh, it inside the uh, PVC pipe, this is one inch diameter, it is open, just like a well, okay? <clears throat> and, uh, and then we wait for three days and in a controlled environment, it becomes hardened. Once it is hardened after three, 72 hours, then it is good to be tested. But this is before, so we put my electrode through this hole Okay, and then say, one, two, three, go. And of course, the cables go inside and they, uh, uh, the open part, you know, be, uh, around these uh, cables that go inside, we put putty, the P-U-T-T-Y putty, P -U -T -T putty uh, a little bit. So the first thing what happens when it uh, uh, disturbs uh, and, uh, and it goes and it explodes the aluminum foil inside at the tip of the electrode, that putty comes out. Uh, we are at the same distance, of course. And uh, we can see the flexors. See over here? Nice flexors. Perfect. And this PVC is not broken. Before it used to get broken, but now we have enough size, volume of the rock, we absorb the shock energy. So that is what we have been looking for. Ultimately, we got it. Now we repeat it for another sample. As I told you, the samples are made identical, a controlled manner. This is a control blow. Just like we say, all other things remaining the same. So that's how this is the standard protocol. And you have to know this before we do any scientific or engineering experiment. So then uh, long then we said uh, from one sample to another, you know, based on whatever we used to learn that we thought maybe some outside, it is five or six pixels, but what is inside? There's only one way to know. If you have a, a CT you know, uh, scanner, micro CT scanner, micro CT, uh, we say micro because micro means it will give a better high resolution. And if there are here thin cracks, we need to have a micro CT scanner. Computer, computer, com computer tomography. Uh, so these are a medical device, of course. So, and our department, uh, my colleague from his research fund, uh, he also had a startup grant. He and he was in petrophysics. So he and core analysis scale that uh, we call in petrophysics scale, special, you know, core lab uh, uh, things. Uh, and uh, uh, and it was a uh, very small, his fund was not used, so he could barely afford. So the opening of the CT scanner, those of you, you know, or he, he have been scanned, was only 12 inches. So he said, yes, yes, two, this is 11 and a half inches, we'll put it inside. We did, scanned it, and then when we looked at the image, this image is as is, as captured by the micro CT scanner. We didn't do anything, of course. He will not do it, he just, I was there and he gave me on uh, this, uh, the stick uh, memory. And then there was a software uh, to process it, not to process, to show it. Uh, we didn't do any processing. Could be done, but I said, no, I want to see as it is. And just like you do x-ray, these are the x-ray views. You can see the fractures. And we shot again and again, first shot, Second shot, third shot. This is after patch, okay? If I go back in this, 
Let's see, we have put some numbers here. One, two, three, four. And at one point, you'll see that after the second blast, that fifth one came up. <coughs> so that made us thinking, why at the time, uh, second blast, an additional factor came. We postulated, we means I, but I cannot talk to the wall. It is my student, Sutesh Lethi. I said, hey, what is happening here? Maybe in the last, in the first shot, that uh, shock wave action, maybe some micro fractures were created inside. And uh, because these shocks last only for a couple of milliseconds, you know, the shock wave, it comes and goes. So we found it, it is around, you know, five to 10 milliseconds. Electrical plasma, it is microsecond, and its effect, conversion into mechanical shock wave, it is, of course, much longer than that. It is in millisecond. So we kept that in mind, and exactly, <coughs> excuse me, at the time that micro cities kind of came to the Department of Petroleum Engineering at Texas Tech, and my colleague, Professor Shamim Siddiqui, uh, and he also left Texas Tech and joined Harry Burton uh, in R&D. So we did the work and beautiful work. Now, of course, these images come in slices. The slices means from top to bottom means along the axial length. So when we run this micro CT scanner, it goes, uh, you know, takes the slices, the pictures every two millimeter, two mm. So there'll be lots of slices. So I wanted to see slice by slice from one end, uh, uh, in this case, from top of the well, from the, to the bottom. And I'll show you, you know, what is, see, over here. So this I call slice number 13 through uh, something you can count over here. And see, this is one, then the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. There were so many, I'm sure only, the, only a few of them. And then if you look, let's say this fracture, this a little bit down, so it is continuing, two millimeter below. Another two millimeter, further down you go, you can see it, you can see it. That means these fractures, what we see here, you know, you know, we are going, what we see on the surface, they are going all the way to the bottom because this is inside the bucket and we don't want to open it, you know. Uh, so, so that's a good thing that these fractures are continuous. But we have much more than that. But we have that we see many more fractures than what we see at the surface. So the fracture network and the bifurcate, the trifurcate. So see, this is the beautiful thing. So it's a nice fracture uh, network. And we did samples after samples, the answer was the same. And why we call it? So this is a control samples, identical. That means what we found is not by mistake, by chance, okay? This is reproducible. That's a big thing. Those of you uh, who know what reproducibility means, fantastic. So <clears throat> that means if someone else uses the same method, exactly the same manner, they'll get the same answer. Now here you ask me, I left Texas Tech three years after that, and what happened? So that thesis, master thesis, uh, was locked, put on embargo. Obviously it has tremendous IP information. We already received uh, uh, these calls from one, very big national oil company, I'll not name here, from the Middle East, and one very big, mighty international oil company, again, I'll not name it, that we want to go and join this research. So we cannot take both. We went for the national oil company because they came here and we gave presentations after they signed non-disclosure agreement and they said, money is no problem. We are for it. So I'll not uh, tell more than that. Otherwise, he'll get with, with the company. It's, it's not fair. It's not a good way thing. But this is fact. But uh, why I didn't continue with them? 
Big companies take time, of course, but uh, something else happened. I found that uh, there were also research engineers in that company. Natural oil company have their own research centers. So, and maybe because they saw me, you know, and they thought, oh, we can do something. So we submitted proposal. And uh, in the proposal, when you do, you reveal lots of information, especially when they have signed non disclosure agreement. Then I found that, no, they are cheating on me, okay? So then I wrote a letter to the chief of that company on my official letterhead from the university. And they stopped. I don't know. And at the time, I got a call from Dr. Phillips over. Professor Awal, we have a project R&D uh, to develop a lab. We have seen your profile uh, in LinkedIn. So can we talk? I said, yes. And then they offered me and uh, this idea also, I presented uh, the whatever I'm trying to you. I showed in this uh, presentation of the interview to them, so I was hired 300% salary than what I used to get at Texas A. <clears throat> And of course, they had already one project working, develop a new fracture conductivity lab. They said, can you do it? Yes. I said, this is uh, like this for me, you know, because I teach hydraulic fracturing and I do research. Uh, uh, so I did that. And the next project that was coming was this one. But at the time, the oil price, oil price came down like this. So they shut down their R&D. So that's how it ended, you know, before it got started at Conoco Phillips. <clears throat> and then I went to American University of Rasul Khaimah. Uh, I had some hope that uh, that is uh, one of the seven, you know, provinces or states or emirate of um, UAE. And UAE has ad hoc all company. They have their resource infrastructure. So hopefully and they can pick it up. <clears throat> but there are so many administrative barriers. I don't blame them because they, they have their own set of rules uh, from American University of Russell Kaima. I could not break those uh, walls or firewalls. So all I had to do is teach, 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 and teach like, of course, not like in Texas Tech, where we professors teach only two courses per semester, not four or five. Uh, so, and of course, without funding, you cannot do research, uh, impossible. So I finished my teaching contract, it was four years. I said, no more renewal. I need to go back for my family reasons, life event, my daughter's graduations, which we did. And, and uh, that happened last year. I had one whole year time to develop further from here. So I have now uh, some slides to answer the questions uh, you know, during presentations to that uh, national oil company, you know, and also international oil company, how can you keep those fractures open without pumping prop and sand? I said, this is a subject matter uh, field in geomechanics or rock mechanics, that in case of hydraulic fracturing, those fracture by pumping, uh, you know, uh, we open these fractures in the directions of what you call it, uh, <clears throat> uh, those principal stresses, you know, the principal, in situ principal stresses, in the maximum, uh, those of you who know maximum, I believe most of you know, maximum horizontal stress and, uh, in the reservoir rock and the minimum horizontal stress to, and of course, the vertical stress. These are called principal uh, and stresses. So uh, this uh, stress happens in the direction of the maximum one. So by principle, rock mechan or the mechanics, uh, you know, when you do uh, through that pressurization rate, which is very slow, which is in minutes, uh, you, know, you know, or maybe in, in tens of seconds, not milliseconds, not microseconds, then it can only open in the principal uh, stress direction, which is the maximum horizontal stress directions. And 
once the fracture is created, you know, uh, there will not be any shear force, any shear force between this face and this face. And of course, the perpendicular direction is the minimum horizontal stress. You know, at 10,000 feet, it can be around 4,000 PSI. So the moment you stop pumping, let's say you're pumping from here, then the pressure, this uh, in situ stress minimum uh, acting perpendicularly to close it will come and close it. That's why they put propane to keep the permeable pathway. Now, in this case, what happens? This fracture, as you've seen, it goes in several directions. Okay, several directions. So maybe, uh, you know, suppose this is uh, the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. Then we have other stress directions also. In those cases, what will happen? There will be also a shear stress. So coming back to this, the shear stress will be here and here. So they pull the two faces apart a little bit by a few millimeters, you know, I mean, maybe a millimeter or fraction of a millimeter, which is good enough to leave some aperture, you know, over here. So now the, uh, the uh, okay, so now what happens? Uh, this is the shear distance directions. This uh, aperture uh, that remains after the pumping is uh, has stopped and the pressure has been depleted from the borehole, uh, a pathway remains there, okay? Now, here is the most important information. How wide is this? This, uh, because of uh, the unevenness caused by the shear displacement, that passage is as good as a hydraulic fracture, okay? And I'll give you some results from, uh, in 2019, uh, Dr. Kas Ahmad Kasemi is the boss of, uh, he was my classmate when I did my PhD. I, I was his one year senior. Now he's the boss, uh, McClesland professor of uh, product mechanics or whatever, he's the chair, Ahmad Kasemi. And, uh, and he and his friend at the Wyoming <coughs> University, they had a research project to <coughs> do this kind of research and see how much it happens. And they prove it that it is measurable, quite good probability, as good as the probability which you get from hydraulic friction. In hydraulic fracturing, you don't get this natural pathways because they get closed because they're in the direction of maximum horizontal stress. I hope I could give it uh, to you. So let's go fast forward. Now, coming back to real wealth. So have you have has anyone tried this? Uh, shock wave fracturing, yes. The shock wave fracturing created how? So there are two ways to create shock wave fractures. One is by using explosives like TNT. Of course, if you remember Beirut blast, that shock wave you've seen, right? And because of the condensation of moisture, that gets like a mist, like cloud, you know, on its path, expanding. That's how we see, otherwise shock wave, you cannot see. And shock wave front is thinner, very, very thin, like you're here. And that will be in one blast, only one shock wave, okay? And, uh, but they tried that thing, of course, United States has uh, five or six national laboratories, from the time of first atomic research, atomic and nuclear bomb research. Uh, so Los Alamos and Sandia National. Okay, so Sandia National is very good in terms of, you know, studying the effect of bombing on concrete and other structures, you know, they're, they're for the military. Uh, so they tried, some scientists uh, tried in 1970, on no, on no, no, no. explosive, it damages the whole well war. It's completely no, no. It is just like killing the well war. So they came to with some milder version, which is not explosive. They call it propellant, something like gunpowder. Okay, if you have a handful of gunpowder, open some safe place outside, and you 
you put fire to it, it will not explode. It will burn like this, you know, and lots of smoke will come that you can see. But if you put that inside a bullet, that's what uh, where they use it, that's a con confined space, sealed. So when you ignite that by sh hitting gun or pistol, uh, that smokes huge amount. It cannot escape. Is contained, so it generates huge pressure. And when is his pressure is more than the tensile strength of the shale, you know, copper or brass, whatever, explodes. Otherwise, in open space, it will not explode. So that's what they tried. They put, let's say, five feet to six feet long propellant canister, put in the well board, and blow it. And they could create, as you can see, here at this location where uh, there are three uh, pictures here in the well bore. It was in Texas somewhere uh, near my cities, but uh, many years ago. And that technology is called uh, the gas gun technology, gas gun. Gas gun company was created by that scientist who did the experiment at San Diego National Lab in the 1970s. So later on he designed and started uh, build a company to sell these ideas. Uh, but it was only a limited success in terms of you know, uh, kicking out or I should say displacing refactoring because this is one of the best case scenario the, by experiment. And those experiments were not reproducible because of so many factors. I could not uh, want to go into that. That company is still there. And the license has been given to some other service companies. They also make it as a steam gun or whatever. So this is one of the best case that it was a vertical wall bore, 2,500 feet, and 18 open hole in permanent basin, you know, maybe 60 miles from my home. And after all the data processing, they had pressure uh, recorders, you know, out in milliseconds uh, sensitivity, everything. And they send photograph uh, to photograph, uh, and, uh, not photograph, uh, and a video. And at this location, uh, this is the vertical scale, so some 2,500 feet below. And uh, the explosion took place over a five, five feet length here. And they found that at that location, there are six, one, two, three, four, five, six fractions. Just like my effect, as you see, you know, it's a pleasure to show you. Sorry. Okay. See, one, two, three, four, five. Three, four, five, like that. Also, in some experiments, I got six, you know, like that. Uh, first shot, I get four, then five, and then shoot a third time, the same samples, I get one more. So this is controllable you know, in my case. But here it is not controllable. You get the chance only once, but uh, it was after so many years of experience and they were successful in the particular case, six. And that also for, uh, it was televiewer, bottom uh, well board televiewer. So they found that as they go up and below the epicenter of that uh, shock wave, the number of fixtures reduced to two fixtures. Okay, to at this point, to at this point. And I can explain it, uh, why not six. And as you can see, it was from 2300 to 2700. How many? 400 feet. Oh my God, for one shot over here, you, you get fractures, six at the epicenter, you know, and up to around 15 feet, you know, 15 feet over there. So, which is quite good. You want to, and 15 uh, of our distance uh, interval of around maybe 20 feet. Okay. So that's quite good. So if, if it's 20 or 50, uh, no, more than 20 feet over here. This part, you have six places and up to 15 feet. That means you're going past the formation damage zone. So, this is a super acid bend, so you will not need any acid job there. So this technology is already there. 
only via propellant, and the components are also there. And uh, so, in my opinion, this technology should have been widely known. And the companies, the, the service providers are there, but they are very limited in terms of still, you know, service uh, people don't know or whatever. But the, more important than that is the reproducibility. You, uh, you don't have con much control over this propellants. Uh, they try to improve, but uh, what you do in one well, you try in another well, it's not exactly the same. So that could be one reason, you know, it didn't uh, gain the trust or the market, whatever, whichever way you call it. But in my case, because I can control precisely, <clears throat> I can create uh, the shocker pulses of different kind. So that's not the meat of uh, presentation today. That's so detailed and so complex for such a short time. It will take a whole semester course, you know, or or if I have received some requests that please give us more on this, I can do that. So that's the story I had in mind. Yeah. I the thesis that was put under lock and key with the electronic dissertation database of Texas Tech University from 2010 to 2015. That was the time when I came out from uh, Conquer Phillips R&D, and I came to Texas Tech. Of course, Texas Tech uh, is my residence hometown. Uh, so I still keep in touch and visit uh, the, the professors. And nobody could do anything with the machine that was built with my research fund. Uh, and and the, <clears throat> uh, OK, this is the first experiment I did just to see how much it comes, you know, uh, what is that plasma? So this is the plasma that I got <clears throat> I put it in a safe manner with only two and a half inch long aluminum foil from the kitchen aluminum foil and the width of one inch, 2.5 inch long, one inch width. This ordinary household aluminum that you put for, you know, covering food trays, you know, <laughs> whatever, aluminum foil. It is huge amount, and the sound was also there, of course, and it was in air. But when we do this explosion inside water, we got a much bigger bang. That's because of one kind of special kind of thermite reactions. I'm not going through that detail. So you get two effects. First effect is direct conversion uh, in terms of millisecond division of shock pulse and after uh, several tens of uh, milliseconds comes other and uh, bigger because of the chemical reaction between this nano because this generates this aluminum foil into nano vapors nano surrounded by water aluminum so it become it is an energetic material the, uh, this can be used as an explosive nano but it cannot be this is the perfect nano here. The nano aluminum powder, it can uh, process uh, for research purpose, I know, especially uh, made. They are not more uh, finer than 100 or 300 nanometers. But here, you can get the ultimate. So I don't want to go into details. So it is more energetic. And uh, so this is the equipment. It was line ideal. So people living for UAE, American University of Russell Kaima. I said, I don't know whether I'll come back or not, or I'm get, get, getting older. So I decided to remove that uh, embargo. So uh, we removed the embargo, and I informed three professors uh, in the department. I'll not name them. And two of them were very happy. Oh, you have done a great thing. Now we can put some PhD students, and they'll read. I said, I have asked my student under my direction that it has large step-by-step -step information, you know, uh, <clears throat> including that aluminum foil, how to get the electrode. But lots of information, of course, I didn't give. And that is my secret as of today. And uh, so what happened, why I'm telling this? 
that it was 2015, I removed embargo, and 2017 from Texas Tech, the first uh, PhD thesis came out from this equipment. What they did, they followed the steps in the master's thesis, which my student wrote under my supervision, and they could reproduce the work, but not like mine. And the reason uh, what not like mine is because I didn't allow the student to write something uh, with some real know-how. Uh, but it is IP, so let us keep it. Even your thesis will be under lock and key. And uh, so that is the reason they could not reproduce. But they did some other additional studies which I did not do. The radiation effect, so that is a wonderful effect. And the principal scientist behind that, I can tell his name. His name is uh, Dr. Uh, I mean, Professor um, Wellinghouse. Now, Wellinghouse, uh, long story cut short, he was the principal designer of the first MRI equipment, magnetic resonance imaging in the 1970s and early 80s at Stony Brook University. Uh, with Professor Paul Lauterbar. And that is just gave birth to MRI, the medical MRI. So he was the chief physicist and electronics expert, the brain, who really developed that. So radiation expert is, and, uh, uh, and uh, could uh, measure the radiation uh, effect, electromagnetic wave, whatever it is. But that's for, of course, physics interest. It does not help in terms of uh, the borehole fracturing. And so they partially reproduce the work. And uh, uh, at this point, I should also name the other professor was Professor Mohammed Soliman. And uh, that uh, PhD student was under his uh, 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 supervision. And uh, they all studied that. Uh, and uh, and uh, did a good job. But uh, I wish uh, uh, they could compare their results with my master's thesis results and ask for me, hey, what is missing? I would help, could help. Anyway, and then I, uh, Professor and Dr. Wellenhouse was also in the committee. Of course, he has to. And uh, after 2017, Professor uh, Mohammed Soliman, he's a very respected uh, you know, well recognized all over the world uh, uh, in uh, in petroleum engineering, yeah. and uh, he became the chairman of University of Houston's Department of Petroleum Engineering with a huge fund from Exxon Mobil, and uh, with that huge funding, he has established a new lab there for exactly the same thing, with more equipment and the research is going on. I also watched his uh, recently after I came back from. Uh, UAE, I watched his uh, uh, video presentation, uh, which is on YouTube. Please see that also. And uh, uh, and uh, that's how uh, this work has continued. To, but the point is, even now in 2020, 2021, uh, last thing I know about 2020, they could not break through anything as far as what I know from their presentation in the public. But if they have achieved one more thing, if they are continuing the research with ExxonMobil, I don't know. And, uh, but what I did the last one year, I just like a self sabbatical for me. So I spent the time uh, to develop the field prototype of that. Uh, what I did in the lab prototype, laboratory, I scaled it up. So, Dr. Awal has upscaled the plasma shock fracturing system for field trial. The complete design is with me. We, if I have funding uh, by oil company or government, I can build it in one year, <coughs> time and test in the yard, make it perfect, go inside the borehole. For it. So I want to give it to the world. And uh, so, and uh, here is my contact information. Any inquiry for field demonstration is welcome. The design is completely ready. It needs fabrications. 
and that means it needs institutional support. So thank you very much for your attention for this. But as I said, uh, that uh, it will take a whole semester course to give everything. And so let's see which way it goes. Uh, to sum up, in the last three days, this is day one, we talked about uh, that why we cannot control uh, a blazing well after blowout within a few minutes. I advanced a new solution that within a minute, it can be shut down. And this may be too good for some people to believe, but I believe it is technology ready. You don't have to do anything, use no R&D at all. Just put a few things together as you have seen. Then on day two, we talked about improving the seal behind the casing. We talked about uh, geopolymer and we talked about metal to metal seal, the pros and cons. We should always keep pros and cons in mind. And today we talked about the need for environmentally benign well stimulation technology. So I believe what I have done with the third generation pulse power technology uh, in terms of converting the stored electrical energy into a mechanical shock of energy that is controllable and reproducible. So I believe I'm the only one so far as far as published literature are concerned. Now there's a lot of research going on from 2015 in China about this, in Korea before 2015, but uh, everything is limited to lab because to grow it from, uh, let's say around three feet to around 100 feet, it's a big way. And the design I have made in last year at the tremendous time and the intention, the zeal, the design I have made now, it is good for that to achieve around 100 feet, but not with this Schwakem only. Schwakem is only the starter point. Then I have developed a mechanical system after that and some other engineer's method, no explosives, no propellant, but other mechanical devices, very simple and ingenious uh, by observing nature. And uh, so that's not a subject uh, of presentation here today. So I call it now electromechanic, uh, electromechanic, electrical parties to create shock wave to begin, take to less than 10 feet and, and continue further with some mechanical and non-mechanical. And this is like, we all know how a nuclear bomb works. They teach it in masters and PhD, but they cannot build it because it needs some extra things. It needs a lots of PNT blocks to put around the core to generate high shock wave at the same time from all this point around that in a spherical shock wave that will converse on the enriched you know, uranium at the same time from all directions and to create that the critical mass, only then the same reaction starts and sustains. And so that is the know-how. So I have the, people have now had the same thing, shock wave, shock wave, shock wave, first generation, second generation, even third generation, because I have released it now, uh, but there is some know-how. And man, I have done of that because this is a subject of interest to leave something for the humanity, not for publish. I have never published a paper. I don't like to waste my time in that, okay? And publish or perish, that's a very bad thing. It's like a bad religion, okay? Uh, those who do, let them do it. But uh, in my case, I love to do the work with minimum money and maximum effect. I don't go for a patent. If I go for a patent, the University of Texas, Texas Tech University was uh, vice president's office. Please submit a few pages. We have patent attorneys. I said, no, we'll do it. Let us do it with some funding from, prove that it will really work in the field, then do patenting or whatever. I don't want you to waste your money. People lose money. I have 10 patents, 20 patents. I say, tell me if one of them has been implemented. Most of them keep quiet. 
Okay, so I don't want somebody else's money or my money. I don't want to waste anyone else's money for name or fame. No, there is not nothing called name and fame. The name and fame should be for what who is goes to help here and here and here. That's my core belief, and I am good with that. If you want that, please give me a call, or uh, we'll talk about it. And I'll not claim for money or these things. I just want this baby to go here and here and do, and here also. And here I don't have much except information, but the day one and day three, there's something solid to help humanity, society, not only for the environment, for the climate also. With that, I'm at the finishing point. So have a good day and good night everywhere. And I thank again the organizer, the host, uh, Pio Petro, uh, uh, for hosting me. Thank you very much, guys. You are doing wonderful. Bye-bye. Um, Rahima? Uh, Dr. Pro uh, Professor, I'm sorry. We have, uh, we have questions for you, if you don't mind. Yes, please. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. That means, uh, uh, that, that so means someone is listening. <laughs> watching it. Thank you so much for this informative session. Uh -huh. So I am I'm going to pursue with our questions from audience. Uh -huh. So my first Go question ahead. is uh, my first question is uh, if we only increase perforations in the upward direction, will this not lead an increased pressure above the center line of the pressure and hence cause a danger to uh, to the stability of uh, of underground pipes? Why don't you increase the perforations horizontally? Uh, I, <coughs> excuse me. I mentioned about that cartoon, the not to extend flexures downward. So I guess the question has come from uh, that point. Actually, uh, uh, putting only perforations in one direction and all other things remaining same, means the same 20,000 PSI, same flow rate, it will create a lot, it will put concentrate all the energy in that direction only. That means now you can frag uh, and make a longer fracture in that direction. But it is quite the ordinary, uh, I mean, the perception. Uh, same thing, you know, for example, let's say you have, you are, you are, uh, if you have to box with somebody, one hand goes this way, one hand goes. The another bad guy this way, you are not winning, but you have the one guy and you aim, so you concentrate all your energy in in one directions, you make the things better. And uh, same thing in my shock wave also. So now, which I didn't tell you, is that now I not just put my aluminum foil uh, inside the borehole. No, I have very special. I'll put everything in one direction, okay, at a time, then. When I make progress, I put again in other directions. So instead of doing, you know, in all directions at the same time, I concentrate in one direction. So it is the same pressure uh, in the pipe, 20,000 PSI, uh, but if we make perforations in, in one direction, it will make longer. But again, in three dimension, again, you know, uh, uh, in case of hydraulic fracturing, it will ultimately come to, because when it grows uh, in particular directions, uh, uh, of course, flexors are two dimensionals, uh, that because of what you call it, that uh, in situ directions, you know, you don't know exactly the direction you're sh uh, shooting. If it doesn't coincide with the principal excess directions, it will go off the direction of the flexors. So, uh, the control is not as good. But in my case, uh, shockwave, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going a little beyond that uh, the, uh, that question. These are only millisecond direction, so fast that it becomes, in, you know, in my belief, uh, based on the knowledge of mechanics, insensitive to the, uh, the principal stress directions. And uh, so that's not the point of discussion. But uh, the answer is, if I understood the question correctly, that uh, uh, putting uh, the perforations before starting hydraulic fracturing in one direction, it will uh, create longer fractures. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for answering mm -hmm. our question. Mm -hmm. And our next question is, can we use this technique in sandstone reservoirs for fracturing? Yeah, that's what I'm waiting for. My phone is at, hello, anybody out there, please call me. In the last year of COVID, I have developed that whole design. All it needs is a fabrication center, which are there, but they'll say, we need this much amount of money, you know, so I have to pay them. <laughs> it's ready to go, test. Not, it was not ready in 2010 because we did it in lab. Then we scaled up the parameters, okay? And that's the real engineering science. And, uh, and uh, in last year, I did that. Not that I, I had actually one small company came. Uh, it was run by one of my Texas Tech students uh, who was my student in production engineering. He, but uh, his partner is a lawyer. So, and they play, uh, he played any, mini, mini, mo. And just before the US presidential elections, uh, they decided we don't know which way the market will go. Uh, for whatever reasons, uh, they said uh, uh, they postponed it. Let me come back again because they're my student. Uh, 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 but uh, I'm not, uh, uh, and the letter of intent, the signs has expired in November. And that's why I'm, I'm now calling the rest of the world, you know. Uh, and, uh, and if you think I'm here to make money, then no, try me, you know. That company, I didn't charge any money. I said, of course, they asked me, Professor Awal, we put money here, less than $1 million, and it becomes successful. What do you want? You want to become president or vice president? <laughs> I said, nothing. If you make profit from your profit, you give me just 3% royalty. If you make profit, that's the, as little as it could be, you know? And uh, so they said, wow. I said, you are my students. Uh, even if you are not my student, I want this thing to go. Because uh, I am crying environmentally conscious spectrum engineering, money engineering from 2010, from a formal platform of my own, uh, you know, <laughs> and I'm much more on that because we can, we can. So it's not, uh, and I had a very successful life. Uh, I'm well settled in America, and I into the Americans are good in terms of generally giving back to the society in education. My, when I was a PhD student, I received generous amount of, uh, you know, like many of uh, my seniors here from India, Egypt, and uh, the rest of the world, you know, from China, South America. We come here as a research assistant or teaching assistant. It's because of the families. They do hard work, earn money through their business or whatever. And they donate this to the universities, you know. They, they are children, they don't say, or they don't ask them, this, oh, we also earn money. So that's how, you know, they are very generous. And, uh, but that also brings the question, why I'm not receiving this as fun? Well, I'm not a marketing person. And now, let's see. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I'll not <laughs> make you poor. Uh, just uh, it is money uh, to build those equipment. That's it, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering our questions. Mm -hmm. And this is for our question for today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can't wait to see our final lecture tomorrow. Thank you very tomorrow much. Tomorrow's final, grand finale. <laughs> yeah, thank you so exactly. much. Exactly. Thank mm -hmm. you. And also, mm -hmm. please, guys, do not forget to finish and submit the quiz before deadline. Moreover, uh, I kindly ask you to join our Facebook group, Ira Boyle and Gaz Academy, so you can get uh, all information about, pre uh, about our previous recent and upcoming courses or subscribe our YouTube channel, um, which is called Paya Petro, and you can rewatch all our webinars from there. Thank you for your attention and uh, stay safe. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.